Hello and welcome to What's the Tea with ACP. We're so happy and uh, excited to have our special guests here today. Uh, just to give you a rundown, if you haven't seen the show before, what is What's the Tea with ACP? It is a live web series where featured artists chat with us about what's going on in their lives, their art, and their social experiences. This week, we have the amazing tenor Patrick Dean Shelton, pa excuse me, Patrick Dean Shelton. And I'm gonna give you a little bit of, hi, welcome. Hello. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm gonna read a little bit about Patrick, let you know kind of what his tea is and a little bit of um, information on him. So Patrick, is a tenor from Long Island and is now a resident of Chicago. He attended the New England Conservatory and the Chicago College of Performing Arts at Roosevelt University. Patrick has also been a young artist at Chicago Opera Theater, Chautauqua Opera, Sarasota Opera, the Music Academy of the West, the song continues at Carnegie Hall, Song Fest, Yannick, uh, wait, Janik Opera? What is it? Uh, Janiac. Janiac Opera. Thank you, Chow. Janiac Opera Company at Brevard Music Center and Opera Theater of Pittsburgh. In the fall of 2020, he will be joining Opera Idaho as an emerging artist. Thank you and welcome, Patrick. Thank you for having me. No problem. Anytime. Come on, get the tea. So next we'll have Mary Hollis Hunley. Let me add her to the stream. There she is. Hello. Thank you so much for being here today. Of course. <laughs> welcome, welcome. So a little bit about Mary Hollis. She is a soprano from Louisville, Kentucky, and will be joining the roster for the Metropolitan Opera during the 2021 season as a cover in Heggie's Dead Man Walking. She was to be making her Glimmer Glass Festival debut this summer as Zamina in Wagner's Define and Fiordo Luigi in a reimagined production of Mozart's Cosi Fan Tutte, uh, uh, also entitled Cosi until her until their unfortunate cancellations due to COVID-19. During the 2018-2019 season, she covered the title role in Janacek's Yanufa, and at the 2018, oh, excuse me, and at the Santa Fe Opera, she was seen as Gertrude in Hansel und Gretel at Michigan Opera Theater and Magda Sorel in Minotti's The Council at Bronx Opera. Her 2017-2018 season included her uh, included Helena in A Midsummer Night's Dream with Virginia Opera, as well as three exciting covers, the title role of Ariadne of Noxos at K uh, Kentucky Opera, Regina by Blitz Stein at the Opera Theater of St. Louis, and Medea in, in Corinto by Meyer at the Teatro Nuovo. She has also received awards from the Brava Opera Theater James M. Collier Competition, Santa Fe Opera, Wagner Society of New York, Metropolitan Opera National Council Auditions, George London Foundation, and Richard Gaddis Fund at the Opera Theater of St. Louis. She holds a degree from Manus College, the New School of Music, and the University of Kentucky. Welcome, Mary Hollis Hunley. Thanks. You think a bio is short until it has to be read out loud. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's great. It's, it's great. Great, great, great. It's perfect. Um, so I just want to let everyone know we do have a Venmo set up through our Compass Projects. If you would like to support the artists, please feel free to donate to that Venmo and help support artists in this time. We know we're all looking for jobs, trying to get it and make it and do what we can to, to keep going in this art form. And we want to make sure that our artists are being supported. So you can do that at our Compass on Venmo. So today's tea. Let's jump in. The T for today is possibility. So what is the definition of possibility? Possibility means the condition or fact of being possible. The archaic of possibility is one's utmost power, capacity, or ability. It's also something that is possible and the potential or perspective value if used in plural. So we want to talk about the possibility of going back in a safe workplace, in a healthy workplace as young artists. Right now, there's a lot of companies that are having their young artists return or looking for their art, young artists to return for the fall season. And we just wanted to have a little discussion and talk about 
what it's like to be a potential young artist returning, what it's like for the young artists who are already there or going or in the process, and kind of some of the disparities and some of the some of the good things, some of the bad things that are happening in our industry in regards to that. So um, I think actually our first question is going to be from Mary Hollis, and it's this question here. Mary Hollis, please feel free to to expound. Sure. So when when I heard about the possibility, this was one of the first things um, that came to mind. And I mean, first and foremost, uh, I guess it's a caveat, but I also have a degree in arts administration and I am so passionate about that side of things. And I've held a position um, working for an opera school for many, many years. Um, and it has brought like such joy to my life and also you know, it's so great to have perspectives from both sides. Like, I never want this to be an us versus them, but the safety involves us all. You know, we are potentially putting the administrative staff at risk when we come. We could be at risk depending on the, the situations at these companies. So, you know, these are the most important questions. And thankfully, we don't really have to do any of this work. You know, it's the AGMA safety guidelines have been published. The CDC, with much smarter people than us, have like put out their recommendations. And, you know, different states have their rules right now. And the government's a whole other mess. You know, but, um, <laughs> you know, we, we've already seen some summer programs that have successfully had um, in-person singing happening. And... Whether we're scared or not, I think every artist on the planet understands that companies can't stay shuttered this whole year or it's going to be a nightmare, um, closure-wise. Closure and that's the absolute last thing anyone wants. So if we go back to work, which we do want to do, um, right. man, I want you know as much outdoor as possible. And one of the saddest things is like I think homestays need to come mm. off the table because you just, you just lose so much of your control when you're staying with other people. And some of the most important people in my lives are the um, donors that I've lived with at different companies. Um, but yeah, the quarantine and the, necess the necessity of that and you know, putting better filters in your HVAC machines and trying to clear rooms out and air them out in between rehearsals and shortened rehearsals and um, you know, those singers' masks, which look like... Like, you know, and all of these things cost money, which is going to be a theme today. It's like, we understand that this costs money, and money more than ever is not um, available. So, mm. yeah, it's just, I think the key is dialogue. It's open communication between the companies and the artists, and it's are you comfortable with these things? Please feel free to have conversations with us. And yeah, rapid testing would be amazing. Mm -hmm. Definitely, um, you know, temperature checks every day, even though we know temperature isn't really a great sign anymore. Um, right. Just flexibility and conversations and yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Patrick. No, I want to, I, I think too, there's this, the dialogue thing is the, biggest um, issue for me personally with all of it. Um, with young artist programs, and I'm speaking generally, of course, but there is an extent to which sometimes you go where you're told, you do what you're told, you get these things done because the opera companies are, you know, big systems that need you to go into place. But I think in this moment, for me, the thing that would make me feel the most safe would for to have that dialogue element be really, really open and also and I, I've spoken to some people and I'm going back to work in September to sing. Um, and I do think that there needs to be discussion too, like with each event you plan, people's mm -hmm. level of comfort is gonna change because I mean, I we as singers are very neurotic people, I think, especially about our health. Um, yep. And we worry about, you know, I have a little bit of phlegm, I, the, the, there's a little bit of too much pollen today and this is a respiratory disease. So that kind of, psychological pressure um, in like trying to keep yourself healthy, I think is heightened to a point mm -hmm. that I've never experienced personally before. Um, 
And I'm so excited to go back to sing because I do think that, especially as young artists, we have this opportunity to engage with communities and kind of like be a way to heal. And because truthfully, you know, over 160,000 people are dead. And it's a really, it's a really scary situation in America. Um, but artists and, and vocal artists in particular, we have um, the ability to express emotions in a way that, you know, transcends other forms of communication. And I mm -hmm. do really want to be able to maybe work with companies as, as this year goes on and in my work as a young artist to develop some community engagement too that makes the work we're doing feel very immediate because I don't think there's going to be hazard pay um, in our industry because just mm -hmm. because we're already um, struggling for money before the pandemic. Um, so we're gonna be going in on, you know, young artist pay, which is, you know, their apprenticeships. Um, and I just wanna make sure that companies are really open to just continuing to talk um, with their artists. But I, and I also think that they, companies need to be willing to potentially cancel things if their artists are become really concerned. Um, and I, I'm interested to see what happens with that because um, I think, and I've heard that there are some people who are looking to put people back into schools doing outreach and things like that. And I, I don't think that can happen, um, personally in a safe way. Um, and I just think it's going to take so much more creativity than we've needed, um, right. to do things. Um, but I do, I want companies to really take their time and keep the dialogue with their artists as open as possible. And I think that that goes beyond COVID too, with safety, um, mm -hmm. in terms of like EDI, B things that we've been dealing with, and then also like sexual mm -hmm. harassment. I think the dialogue is really, really the key to all of this. Um, mm -hmm. Having places in your company and having people that your artists can go to and express their concerns where they will really be heard. Um, and I think this moment kind of opens that up since we're gonna be going slower no matter what, we're gonna have less artists um, coming into work. We can have these maybe more difficult conversations that we don't always have time for um, now. And I think it is important to not rush into this moment um, and really take it one day at a time together. And I think that's gonna be really important going forward. 100%. Um, I, I like where you touched on EDI looking at a space for safe workplace. So for people watching that may not be familiar with the term EDI, it means equity, diversity, and inclusion. Now, people may think these are all the, the same things, right? But equity is creating space for people who are already maybe disserved or have been uh, mistreated and creating a space for them to flourish by maybe adding a little bit more, making the box a little bit taller, right? Um, and then diversity is having a diverse group of people around you, whether that be with your uh, race, whether that be with sexuality, whether that be with gender, all of these different things and are, are under the umbrella of diversity. And then inclusivity or inclusion or however you however you want to say it, is making sure that everyone is being heard within those different parameters, right? So you may have a company who has a very diverse workforce, but if the people who are being who are, you know, the workers are not being heard by management and management is also not diverse, then there's no inclusivity there, right? And something, um, I just had a, a talk with uh, Donna Walker Kuhn, who is one of the leading specialists of EDI in the arts. And she also added the term accessibility, which I thought was fabulous because she, really, I mean, it kind of opened my eyes to, yeah, you're right. We should also make the arts accessible, whatever that looks like, right? Making sure that, you know, we have performances that aren't, that that range in price value. Having performances that people feel like they can go into and not be, you know, feel uh, uh, uncomfortable. Or having spaces for people with, uh, you know, maybe they have a 
some type of learning uh, challenges. They might want to, you know, there there's different things. There's different things that we can do and different things that companies can do to make their uh, companies more accessible, diverse, equitable, and inclusive. And um, I think that is a major part of the workforce, workforce for safety, right? Because yes, we're talking about COVID, but we're also talking about a new way of thinking when it comes to all of these things and, and obviously sexual harassment as well. Um, so I, I like the points that you all brought up because it's a big deal going back and doing something that is singing right now is is a risky business, right? I mean, we produce particles that are smaller than the typical part particles because of the way that we breathe, right, as a singer. And so those particles, this is just, I'm giving y'all some information, I'm giving y'all some tea, honey. Um, those particles are smaller than the typical particles uh, when we're speaking. So when we're talking about being in a room with, you know, five, shoot, four other people, and you have to sing a quartet, and even with social distancing, there's still those lingering particles in the air. So I liked what Mary Hollis, what you were talking about of changing air filters, making sure things are filtrated, making sure that there's air moving in the space. Um, I, could you talk a little bit more maybe about that? Like maybe um, what you think could be, you, you mentioned outside performances. Do you have any ideas of what that may have a possibility of looking like? Yeah, I mean, look at the wonderful document that, you know, Wolf Trap has put out there with the safety guidelines they used, which, I mean, I think it's been a few weeks and there were no um, reported incidents of anyone mm -hmm. getting sick. And I I think there's a there's also a big difference though between these festivals that have the ability to do a lot of things outdoors, mm -hmm. but we can copy um, some of these things that have been mm -hmm. successful Mm -hmm. far. And if we know COVID's going to change and the information about it is going to change. Right. Um, but yeah, singing outdoors, there's obviously the natural wind that's going to carry things away. Um, plexiglass shields between mm. singers and the pianists who are going to be much more stationary than we are. I, I think if I remember correctly, the AGMA um, safety guidelines said something like each singer needs, was it 50 cubic feet? Yeah, something like yeah. <clears throat> your rehearsal space the taller the ceilings obviously the easier you're going to be able to space your artists out in a way that has been defined so far as safe um one of the big reasons audition season has moved online is because even if the singer right before you is standing in the same place and then you come in and you stand in that same place the particles are still in the air and i think they said 12 to 15 minutes or something terrifying Where are you? it it just calls for you know, breaks and um cleanings of cleaning of surfaces and you know trying to cover every possible um what is what did they say mucus membrane, mucus membrane. Like, mm -hmm. like your nose your mouth even your tear ducts now they're saying um, yeah i can't yeah. imagine we'll be wearing goggles on stage mm -hmm. but Underwater themed opera, yeah. boom! I'm but just the, on the idea. <laughs> the the real thing with the indoor rehearsals, though, is that at the moment they the they think that the biggest risk is particle concentration, mm -hmm. and that's sort of when you rehearse inside. If you don't take breaks and you don't have the highest quality HEPA filters, mm -hmm. um, the air can't clean, and the particles don't just sit in the air; they build up and get more concentrated. Um, so I do, I think the outside thing is, is really interesting. And I do think at least until the fall, and then I guess in, at some of the Southern companies that have, you know, less winter, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, we do really need to be thinking about like, how can we be in parks? What community group, what, like, uh, like, and I do think we, companies need to really be looking at the community outside themselves. Mm -hmm. and seeing like how can we partner with a group that has space here that's outside or what can we do to be to like um co-produce with like a theater company that's also looking to do things outside because i do think co opera companies have you know finite resources and a lot of times they rent the theater that they use normally anyway mm -hmm. um 
So I do think like putting things in the street, figuring out ways to do things at a distance. Kansas City, um, I don't know if either of you know Danny Belcher. He just mm -hmm. sang on a concert with yeah. Kansas City a couple days ago. And they have an arts district in Kansas City with these big parking lots in it. Um, and they had people out in parking lots in the big circle, socially distanced. The singers were on a stage, probably almost a football field distance from the audience. Mm -hmm. And I, when I looked at that, I was like, I would do that. That, that I, mean, I, I would do that. That seems like something I would be very happy to do. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of a nice way to get, I, I think we also, we have this responsibility as, you know, an arts organization, arts, arts organizations and artists that work with the community to also kind of help the community figure out how they can do things and gather in a safe way too. Mm -hmm. um, and it's our responsibility, both like to our audience and to the community at large to be encouraging good behavior as I, I, I hate to say it like that, but in terms of um, COVID responsibility, because part of the reason that we, we can't get back to work to normal is because the pandemic is sort of raging out of control to an extent in America. And that's why Europe is going back because they've been able to, in some countries, get things, uh, get infection rates at a, at a lower level than, than we have. Um, so I do think we sort of have a responsibility as leaders in the community to also, when we do present anything, to make sure that we're being really clear with our audiences about, um, like, this is the right way, this is the best way to keep everybody safe. And then I also just want to go back to this, uh, the EDIB thing and where mm -hmm. it intersects with COVID, because I do think that there is sort of like the equity and accessibility thing are two things that given the recent events um, in regard to the murder of George Floyd and, and the way that COVID, and then separately the way the COVID-19 pandemic is affecting communities of color, there is like a really important intersection of talking about and dealing with, with this disease and presenting things and actually reaching in and um, engaging with communities of color um, who've been affected by this. And I think too, in engaging young artists and talking about safety, like if we wanna be really equitable in terms of race, we do have to look at how COVID has, um, you know, affected communities of color disproportionately. And then also on the part of accessibility, I have a lot of concerns because I have many singer friends that have pre-existing conditions. Mm -hmm. And I do think that companies, if they've offered contracts to people, which many have, they need to consider things like letting some of the young artists maybe not come and do everything in person so that they can keep their artistry up but not have to risk their health because mm -hmm. making the choice to go back to work right now, like I'm, you know, under 30 and I'm pretty healthy for the most part. Like my risk, my base risk level is lower than other people's. And I do think we need to give people the space to not take opportunity away from them mm -hmm. um, because of, you know, health conditions or pre-existing conditions that they have no control over. Um, and I do think as like, you know, arts organizations that are ostensibly liberal-ish, mm -hmm. um, you know, we do need to think about that. And then, and to bring our art for that, thinking about that will help administrators open their minds to creating more accessible events too. If they can personalize these issues with people they know, it's easier to think about how can we have a concert that, you know, reaches out to autistic, autistic children, or mm -hmm. how can we bring a sign language interpreter in? Like if you right. look at people, if you look at people as people, these artists you work with as like whole individuals and you really learn about their experiences, it opens you up to new ways of doing things, I think. 100%, 100. And you know, something, so we have another, uh, another question, which is what, uh, what improvements could be made in regard to the protection of young artists? Now, we've, we we kind of touched on this a little bit with just our general discussion, but I think also maybe talking about transparency is a major um, issue, I think, right now with companies still and how they respect their young artist singers and just singers in general, soloists in general. Um, making sure that there is a clear plan prior to the, the 
artists arriving, right? So like um, Mary Hollis, you mentioned Wolf Trap, which they just successfully, they finished. And so they were able to have their, you know, season, though it was a little bit short, you know, it was a little small, but they were able to perform. They were able to express themselves artistically and put things out there that can be used now in the future, right? And they had such a comprehensive strategy for what they're planning, what they were planning on doing, how they were running everything, and the way that their young artists were expected to also act as well as be treated, right? Because we have to know that as young artists, we also have to be responsible for ourselves, right? Your health reflects, yeah, your health reflects your your singing partner's health. Yeah. Because you have to be knowledgeable about these things. So what other kind of, so we know like transparency and documentation, are there other things like administratively that we could um, ask for or, or want for um, the protection of young artists, whether it be for COVID or just in general? Mary Hollis. I mean, this is what I'm most passionate about and my favorite part about my job at the conservatory where I works is that dialogue with the students and with the singers that are, you know, I feel like a grandma when I work there. These lines are all blurred. I mean, for decades in the industry, mm -hmm. what level are you, uh, whatever. Um, but yes, it's, it's the dialogue, it's the transparency. And when I was preparing for this talk, I was like, you know, this feels a little bit like, coming into the echo chamber, which mm -hmm. is what we're all guilty of on our, you know, by who we follow on Instagram. And, you know, we very rarely see differing opinions. And when we get into it like this, it's easy for us to talk about, and it's important for us to talk about these things. But the goal is to have a seat at the table with these administrators and to use each other as, you know, different perspectives and, you know, learn from each other's English. <laughs> learn from each other's experiences and, experiences and be able to brainstorm together and just, um, you know, I think that one of the biggest struggles about where, where we are right now is that there's so little information and right. companies can't make plans either. We don't know how COVID is going to continue. Every administrator that I've talked to that's a friend has like very openly said, you know, we have plans A, B, C, D, through Z, and we're just having to wait. And they don't feel like it benefits anyone to even put out something unless it's a, you know, um, finished plan. Mm -hmm. But young artists are starved for information. Any update at all um, just means so much. And I think calms so much just to know like we are thinking about you we are trying to get you back to work we're trying to get work done like we you know it so there's this understanding but yeah the dialogue just really helps and i think that's the whole point of conversations like this is like you know we have opinions we are working artists right we want to work you want to put us to work let's talk right um, Dialogue. Dialogue. Yeah. Because I think I, with this issue of transparency, I, I and I, I can only speak from my own experience with this, um, but I think many administrators, and I genuinely think that they are driven by this, that, that when they work with young artists, they their best interests are, they feel their best interests are in young artists, you know, are, are with the young artists. Mm. And I genuinely think like 99% of the time that is the case but I do think there is a tendency to forget sometimes that we are like young people who are very, very insecure lives in terms of like how we are compensated, how, where we live, how we travel, how long we get to live in a place, like how frequently we are, our name is on a lease. Um, and I, I, you know, and I, I, in how many people, and I, I, I said this to a, a few singers the other day, but I, I've worked a couple of gigs where I've talked to singers who live in their car between their gigs, you know, because it's easier than getting on a lease somewhere. And the idea of breaking a lease could ruin them financially, you know, if depending on what city they're in. Mm -hmm. um, and 
I know it feels like sometimes if you give us information, we're going to run with it and, you know, yeah. take it out of context. But even just an email from people that says like, you know, we don't know too. <laughs> um, right. And this is, yeah, I think can be so much more like soothing to the like anxiety level that young artists are, because that's the thing. I mean, young, young artists are so, oh, are in this sort of like anxious stage of their life for, you know, between whatever it is, if you're lucky, like 2018 to 22 when you start, if you're, takes a little longer, you know, you're a little older, but you know, it's this potentially like 15 year period of, of your right. life. Right. Um, where, you know, it, it, you commit for the art form to this insecurity it's part of it, but information helps so much just so you can like go and about your day properly. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are times that I've, you know, been waiting for to hear things or like waiting for communication where it really becomes like the only thing I can think about and so much speculation. And truthfully, like, I don't think that any administrator anywhere wants young singers to be speculating about every possible reason that they're doing the things they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that tends to actually lead to more misunderstanding than just being open and saying, you know, like, we're working on it. Things are changing. It's very complicated out there. Our state has these rules. I know your state has these rules with COVID in particular. But um, just saying, you know, we're working on it and it is so, so helpful. And two, like, it makes us feel like we can then potentially air concerns if we have them, if you're coming from a place that is open to. Mm. Um, and then at this time, with going back to work, like the anxiety level is gonna be so high in terms of like us worrying about each other. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's all. And I will say that is already my biggest concern is like, I'm so worried about my colleagues. I'm like worried about them as people <laughs> mm -hmm. and about their health. And that needs to, we need to all be, the administrators down to the like lowest paid person, the super that comes in to do whatever. Like there does need to be like this communal support that starts with dialogue. And right. we really, I think we really need to be thinking about having young artists come in and really making them part of the community as opera company too, and not just there to like fill this like puzzle piece that needs to be mm -hmm. filled. Right, right. Um, which I think a lot of times is like what young artists do places. It's like, these are the six tasks that we won't ask professional <laughs> artists to do. Mm. So like, we'll have the young artists because somebody needs to do them. And then they'll like go home and get their paycheck and come back and do it until the program's over. <laughs> And right now things are just so serious out there. Like it can't just be that, <laughs> that. Right. Um, and I, I, yeah, it's hard for me to kind of get a whole picture in my head about what I really want and what I really think improvements need to be. But communication and dialogue is where it has to start. And I think that with our art form in particular, we're worried about attracting new audiences so frequently, right? This is like such a big thing. But you have these young people who are coming in to work for your company who, you know, listen to pop music and are interacting with, you know, television or interacting with TikTok <laughs> or interacting with like Instagram, knowing how to, you know, host these digital platforms. If you have a dialogue with us, like there are so many ideas you haven't thought of, not for lack of trying, just because there are so many ideas out there. And I think in this time, young artists, companies to look to young artists to drive a certain amount of the creativity that we need to get through to the other side of whatever, you know, a post COVID or a contained COVID world looks like. Right, right. Go ahead, Mary Olive. Sure, just one other thing, like, I, hi, Kimberly, I saw your post um, along the exact same lines. Like, you know, she's asking innovative types of performances Right. Um, yes, again, Patrick mentioned, you know, these decisions are being made. Yeah, thanks for chiming in. Um, I'm really excited about what some of the things this upcoming season are going to look like, some of these new performances. You know, 
singing outside on a stage with a big old screen behind us, you know, while people drive in and like park their cars like an old drive-in movie or, right. you, know, we, <laughs> um, you know, yes, I think um, what was mentioned earlier by Mr. Ortega, you know, we're gonna have smaller scaled pieces. This is a perfect opportunity for new works to be created, new chamber operas. Um, I think we're gonna find more collaboration between the film industry and the opera industry. And we're gonna be filming operas mm -hmm. in rooms or outside that are just gonna be then rented out or streamed out, or you know, that's what's gonna be sent to schools as outreach instead of in person. I just think there's, there's so many opportunities for this industry to evolve and exactly now to attract new audiences and mm -hmm. kind of take some of the stigma away. And there are so many brilliant people in this industry. A lot of them are just starting out. And this is the time when we're going to be able to fund this sort of level of like new work and get this stuff out there. And exactly. It's just going to, it's just brainstorming. It's a round table. I want everyone in the, I mean, it's such a pipe dream. And it's like, get your head out of the clouds, girl. But we have the time. Yeah. We have the time. I'm at home. Yeah. Well, glimmer glass is over. <laughs> what am I doing? Like, I don't know. I just, I think it's so exciting. I think it's so hard to find any silver lining right now, but if there is one, that's it. Like mm -hmm. this is when we're going to be able to create these new, like we can create a new image for this industry. Which is necessary. I think I really, but I really think too, there's this moment where like opera is so insular, you know, Mm. We do this thing, we think about opera as this particular sort of like box. And, e and even from the smallest companies to the biggest company, it's still this like opera box. And what I really want is, uh, I, ecumenical is like not the right word, but interdisciplinary maybe. But mm. like I, I'm in Chicago, I want Lyric and COT and the Art Institute and the dance companies that are here they're all, none of them can do what they were supposed to do before. And a corporation is affecting all of the arts. Are these companies getting together? Are the heads of these companies and the artistic directors of these different art forms getting together and talking about how they can do things together mm. to, to just before even the creative part to share expenses on whatever they're going to put forward so that each one of them has to take less risk individually in this time where, you know, making money is not, is gonna be hard and getting people to come to things, even if they're outside is, is gonna be harder, you know, but I, I really think we have this moment where we could be expanding this box and really like throwing the box out, getting rid of the box. I don't think the box helps us. I mean, I love, I love big Verdi opera. I love, big, I like, I love big Mozart opera. I'm not saying that there's not a place for us to come back and be able to do these big traditional, you know, war horses that are, are important for different reasons. I mean, many of them need to be recontextualized, but that's like a whole other conversation. <laughs> um, but I'm not like, I, I'm not a person who's out here to like destroy opera. I, right. I love singing traditional repertoire. I, I prefer that as, a, as an artist personally, but I also don't, I mean, I can't ignore the value that is new right. and the value that is, that comes from, you know, our art reflecting our experience in a way that is like actually visceral right. um, and you know, prescient to our ac actual lives. Um, but I do think in this moment, what I really, really want to see is arts leaders coming together from different disciplines and figuring out what they can do together mm. to be better members of their communities. Because like that is, we need, if we want, in, funding for the arts in America is private. So if we want people to come back and remember that we are like just as important as, you know, Handmaid's Tale or whatever TV show you can get streaming at like any time, we need to show what is valuable about us to people and invite them to be a part of that. Because when we create, if when we create real value for, for audience members, they create 
value for us too. Like that feeds our artistry mm-hmm. and that makes it so we can do uh, more things, you know, <laughs> the more people that are interested, the more we can do and the more different kinds of projects we can do. And I just think we really need to step outside of this, like opera America opera is this thing mm-hmm. box. And also look at what theater companies are doing. Like, Yes, Agma has come up with guidelines. Yes, Wolf Trap has come up with guidelines. But like, what are the theater companies doing? What are the dance companies doing? How are the museums handling this? Like, I really want to see from a safety perspective too, Mm -hmm. some of these organizations like really work so that, you know, the arts are kept safe, not just opera. (laughs) Right. Like the arts in America are kept safe because we have to really care about the arts in America and really make people care about the arts because the government is never going to as it stands currently. Mm -hmm. And now we really have to double down and reinvest in our communities in a way that we didn't before, or maybe we're trying to do, but couldn't quite get at. Mm -hmm. But now we have time to like get in there and, and do these things. And I think too, we need to be looking at how we can help non nonprofits that are non arts organizations too. Like, are we going, we're interested in dealing with sexual harassment. Like, are we sending artists to do work in women's shelters? Yeah. Like, are we, there is a lot of food insecurity right now because of the economy. Are we like working with local food? When we have our young artists come, are right. we sending them to help their, like, are we sending them out to sing for an event that a food bank is doing to get, um, you know, non-perishables? Or, right. Right. And like, I would be, I I can only speak for myself, but I would be happy to also, I would be willing to do more things if you told me the reason for them was really going to help someone like in a way, in a direct way. Right. Yes, our singing does that on like an emotional level always, but sometimes in, in moments like this, for me, I want to really be able to physically see how I can help. And I think we have a lot to offer in that regard, there's so much talent right. that, you know, like it, our voices can help bring people who wouldn't come to a charity event to that charity event. Or you have board members that really like opera, but maybe like don't pay so much attention to social issues in your city. Mm-hmm. If your singers are like interacting with those organizations, you're also <clears throat> bringing money to right. these other people that need it too. <clears throat> and I think we can get a little because it's so competitive to get money for opera, and I hate to use this term and it's a little bit too harsh, but we get a little greedy about Mm -hmm. protecting, like these are the people that support us and we don't want to like- Interrupt that that kind of system that's already set in place, right? Yeah, and I think we tend to try to go to other places to get people to be interested and then become donors in us. And I think we kind of need to work both ways. Mm-hmm. Well, that's my take. <laughs> well, well, also that in turn, when things eventually return to a more stable state, it's the seeds that you sow now, right? It's the seeds that you put into the ground now, and you'll see the fruit of that labor later. So, yes, you know, you may be doing things that are unconventional, but the return on the investment that you put down is extremely important right now because things will flip back, things will turn back. And then once I have a feeling that once now that companies are more awake and willing and hopefully still championing in the future, um, different versions of equity and, and things like that, companies will grow, period. Like things will grow, things will change, they will evolve with new ideas coming in, things will always start to go on an upshift. Um, And I think when that upshift starts, it may not be in six months, it may end up being in three years. But that's not the the point of investing is to put something in it now and let it grow, right? Um, and, And something that I, when you were talking about putting opera in a box, I think that we tend to forget, not we, but people tend to forget that op- the singers who are singing operatically are typically singing that way because that's what our voices are set up to do. It's our natural instrument and the way that it's produced for most, 
for I think most of us, we have a, a, a singing classically is something that our throats do, right? Like I never thought, I never, when I was growing up, I wasn't like, oh, I'm going to sing like r and I was like, no, this feels, this feels more right vocally than singing pop music. Like this is what feels natural. And I think that sometimes when we think about opera and think about the history of it, we tend to think like, oh, it's, it's older. It's like a, a old art form. Like this is what people used to do. Like this was their Netflix back in the day. But really it is just about the way that our technique works. Right. There's no difference between going to a musical and going to an opera for real, for real. I mean, except for microphones. But like I said, it's all based about technique. So when we're talking about opera, I hope that people don't keep thinking, oh, opera is, you know, this art form for like old white people and blah, 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 blah. No, I'm telling you now, I'm a young, black, queer ma man and I sing opera because that's what my voice likes to do. If my voice was like to sing another genre, maybe I would do that too. But the thing is, that's not what my that's not what the instrument was that I was given. So when when we talk about like making opera accessible, talking about keeping opera um viable, it's not just about keeping it because it's an old art an old art form. It's about keeping it because the singers that are doing it, this is the way that we are set up to sing. This is the way that our voices were made. And yes, we can sing other genres. Like I can't. No. So, so, let me see. <laughs> Some of us can sing other genres, but for most of us, this is the way that we that is our instrument. It's like you wouldn't tell a pianist to stop playing piano. No, they 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 are attracted to the piano. That is what their their hands, they're blessed to be able to do that, right? So you wouldn't tell a pianist, well, um, piano is like dead, so you're gonna have to switch to like, um, I don't know, the drums, because that's a percussion instrument. You know what I mean? It's like, no, we we want it, we want to. The young generation of opera singers, we want to invigorate. We want to get people excited about opera. Yes, the technique is classical. Yes, it reflects times from long ago. But we want to be able to sing the way that our voices are set up to sing, but with current events. Like, come on. You know, it's, it's, it's as simple as that. It's just a I different think, type of singing. I think people tend to forget that it's theater. Right. I mean, tr truthfully, I think that that is a lot of what causes that. Like, people are like, I forget that it's just another part of theater. Mm -hmm. um, and we just have this technique that supports our ability to do this specific genre of theater. Right. And I mean, that's why I got into it. It's because I wanted to do musical theater and I was too loud and had too much vibrato. Okay. And, and some very, very, very supportive choral teacher was like here do the like um you know all state competition in new york right. sing a yep. copeland song and oh, i was like I, I, I love this. <laughs> you know <laughs> but I, I, my attraction to this was always about theater and i, I mean truthfully if you really wanted to get into it with me like my taste in directors and things reflects that i mean i like the like weird i i like traditional work but i like traditional work presented in weird ways oh, like, I love yeah I like a good Robert Wilson production where everyone's moving like two miles an hour through like, a <laughs> five hour partner opera like, that does satisfy me I know that's not for everybody <laughs> but I do think that that's the thing like it's about making theater visceral and then to go back to the thing you were saying about sowing the seeds this is something I've been thinking about a lot with we talk about how we want to have more diverse audiences and like basically we want like black people and Hispanic people to feel comfortable coming to our theaters. Well, what are we doing for the community organizations that support them? Because we have not given them any, I mean, like I, I, I per, we have not as an industry really given anything to these communities. Yes, there are certain people who we have supported and you know, there's the Leontine prices and things like that. But if we really want to expand our audience then we have to give to the communities so that then they feel like we're invested in them just as we're expecting them to be invested in us. 
Right. You know, and I mean, I'm speaking obviously as like a cis white man, <laughs> but I do feel that that's like where the real issue is. Like you can say that, you know, we want these, this, this different, um, you know, um, part of the population to come and be a part and come and feel comfortable. But you know how you make people feel comfortable? You like go to their home and you like make them feel like you're their neighbor who cares about them. Right. Or and not then, even make them feel, but let them know that you're there. Yeah, yeah. Right. Let them know, because, because I think that that's the thing, right? Is that for years, opera companies have been doing, well, that's our next question, right? From the why perspective, what improvements could be made to outreach programs to better engage more diverse communities? So mm -hmm. For years, opera companies have been saying, or companies in general really, have been saying, oh, well, we go do outreach. We, you know, we sing to children in schools and we, you know, we do, we do that. We have, we have funding for that. We do that, right? We have a lot of funding for that because that's where we get a lot of our grant money from. Right, exactly, <laughs> right? But it's not, one of the things, actually, I'm going to pull this book up, honey. <laughs> invitation to the party, okay? Something I, I learned reading this book was that a lot of companies go out and do outreach, but they don't actually foster the connection throughout a, 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 a linear space and time, right? It's very chopped, right? Everything is staccato. We need more legato movement, okay? We need more connection in the sound. So I think that one of the things is creating opportunities for young artists to go out into diverse communities, but not just, oh, well, I'm going to have my Black young artists go sing something from Porgy and Beth to an inner city school in order to make them interested in opera. Right? Yeah, it's like people have never heard of pandering. Right. <laughs> and so we need to think about things such as like, going to a community that is underserved financially, whether they be whatever race, right? Race, religion, creep, creep, whatever. Going out to those places and saying, look, we're young. We like opera. Maybe you would like it too. Here's an example of it. Ask me some questions about what I do. What, are, what do you do? Oh, interesting. And start a real dialogue because a lot of times we just go in singing and then we're like see ya you know what I mean go go ahead Mary Hollis no, and I have a question because yep. as a privileged white woman this is not something that I feel like I should have a stance on or what and I would love no you should well, you should you well, should I could do the work once I know what needs to be done but I, oh, you know what I mean it's just right. it's tricky yeah, it's, yeah. There's such an important thing though about seeing yourself represented. So I am not one that's like, we need to do a production of Port Game Best mm -hmm. every day and have black people go into the schools just so that, you know, these different districts and schools will see people that look like them. Right. But is there, I think the diversity and, you know, the representation that these students see is what is so important. So is it more about what, like what piece it is, like what, um, like not which opera you're doing because it's outreach. It's not that, but right. uh, how do how do we balance, you know, the ideas of tokenism versus actually having a, a good diverse group? I I think I think I have kind of an answer to that, and I want Patrick to answer as well. well I have two things I just want to, I, I phrase this question this way on purpose because I hate the word outreach. And that's where I want to start <laughs> with my feeling about this. I think we need to throw it away. I think it's really colonial. I think mm -hmm. it implies that we go in and we serve, we give them something and then we walk away. Mm -hmm. And the word needs to be, it needs to be called community engagement to start. Oh. And that's, I, but it's a big thing and it's like a, kind of currently unfolding discussion in this sector of classical music. Um, and I think that you're, you're hitting on something really interesting, Mary, though, about representation in, in this um, kind of going into communities. But I think that there is the, the other element is that we need to look at what the role of art can be. And I'm going to shout out to 
Chautauqua Opera for this. I was part of their first year that they did community engagement programs. And there was a really, really intense teaching element to it. So mm -hmm. at every performance, we had 40 minutes that we had to go into the classroom and teach lessons that were based on this kind of this style of curriculum called arts integration, mm. where um, a bunch of educators have gotten together and done a bunch of research about how you can teach basically every subject. Kimberly did it with me. <laughs> so, hey, Kimberly. <laughs> oh, um, wow. But um, how you can teach every subject through the arts. So we went into the classroom and we talked about the uh, an aria and we wrote the text out and then we talked about different um, musical elements like um, timbre and tempo and we taught the kids about that and then talked about expression and when you read certain texts how can you use different elements to um, inflect the um, you know tone and the and, and the meaning of what you're saying and so it was this English lesson about communication you know and then when we went to do the shows the kids knew like the kids had already had questions they already were thinking about what does art mean and we used sections of the piece we were going to sing to do these lessons mm -hmm. and i think that that is frequently with like so many arts education has been pulled from so many public schools and even where i grew up when i was there i, I mean i'm lucky we are uh, my parents were civil servants but we lived in a district that had unbelievable arts and music but even since i've graduated you know 10 years ago the budget has been you know destroyed there are so many of the teachers that are so important to me like don't have jobs anymore mm -hmm. <clears throat> but i think that it's like really going in and showing people what art the transformative power of art and that art is, and singing and opera is more than a presentation. It's like a way of, it's a lens with which you can view the world and deal with the way that you move through the world. I mean, and that's the thing for me, like, and I'm sure for both of y'all and, you know, most anyone who enjoys music, it helps you process the way you, you know, move through your life. Right. And I, I think that making people and especially young people aware of that kind of um, like power of art gives them an agency. And es especially with singing, you don't need anything to sing. Mm -hmm. You don't, you don't need anything. You don't need money. You don't need anything extra. Our bodies do it. And there is like an agency that you can, lead people to and it, how, ask them to engage in with you through art that I think frequently, especially in lower income places, but in a lot of public education, there is a sense of like, here's the information, take the test. Mm. And you wanna make art immediate, you have to like go into communities and be a part of the community and show what your role is so that people can then choose to engage with it or not and also meet people where they are in, in, in engaging with it. Right. But I really, I do think it's like moving away from this outreach model and it's also really, and I see this, companies sort of like figured out like, this is the, again, I'm gonna use the puzzle piece metaphor, but this is the puzzle piece of outreach. And if we do this set of things, we can apply for this grant money. And obviously there are administrators who are thinking like beyond this. So it's not a blanket, but there's a lot of, this like, this is the way that we do outreach so that we can get these grants. And that's where we leave it. But that's how you build audiences. You need to be thinking, if we're, our art firm is what, 200 years old? We should be thinking 20 years out in yeah. terms of engagement. Like you, if you invest in your public schools, in like I live in Chicago, if Lyric or COT invests in their public schools in a way that like you said, creates this line and carries through and also like goes to the public schools and says like, where we know you've lost funding. We have these resources. Where can you plug us in to make up for the fact that you lost this funding? Mm. What services do we already have the skills to provide you that we can then like go in and, you know, fill this gap that we are qualified to fill and I, and really be thinking like this child who's in kindergarten now, when they're 25, 
we want them to be an audience member. And that takes, opera's like not that easy to like stay interested in unless you have the like bug for it. Mm. It takes, you have to do a certain amount of like research or like a certain amount of like looking up the plot and figuring out what these like crazy Italian names are, this like wild German plot is, you know, sometimes it, it takes, a, it takes a little bit of work to really enjoy opera fully, I, mm. I think. And that's work that it's sort of our responsibility to help new audiences do because like, why would anyone just want to do a bunch of work on their own? People have like jobs and families and lives and especially in these in communities where people are maybe like more um, struggling financially more, like it's not easy to just add, you know, mm. oh, we're gonna, we're like, you know, we want our child to have arts appreciation. You know, like you have two jobs. Right. We're just trying to make sure your kids get fed. You right. know, like it's it is it's our responsibility to create the infrastructure for to create this line. And I, this is like a wild idea I've been having, but <laughs> so this British theater company um, does this program where they go into like inner city and poor communities that have community centers, and they recruit, they seek out talent, and then they provide training programs and put on shows with them. And I really do think. Opera companies need to be thinking regionally and together to be looking. If we want more diverse artists, we need to be going into like elementary schools in communities that are underserved and finding kids who are passionate about music and helping them. Because like even me, I'm like privileged and white and from Long Island and lived close to the city. And if there weren't specific people in my life who held my hand and told me like, this is the door you go through, I would not be where I am. And I can't imagine trying to do that or how much harder that would have been had I not like had many people available to hold my hand. Mm. And like we want, the education system is so fraught in America to begin with, but like if we want more diverse voices, then we have to start nurturing them early and like through middle school, through high school, like helping people apply to colleges, helping people connect to scholarships, you know, helping young a high school singer that's talented that maybe doesn't have the resources, connecting them with donors that you have at your opera company who want to do, you know, direct aid to people. There are plenty of rich people who want to just throw their money at people and feel better about themselves or <laughs> that do just care and want to be very right. involved. Like there is both. Right. And like, we should be using that. I mean, conservatory is really expensive in America and to take mm -hmm. on that debt, first of all, like you have to have someone, if, if you don't have scholarship, you have to have some, we're going to talk about this later, but you have to have someone to, who can co-sign your debt. And that's like, it's a whole other thing <laughs> that no one ever talks about. Right. But, you know, if your family doesn't have good credit, you might not be able to go to the college you want because you can't, you don't have the credit to take out the loan that it, it, it you need to go to that school. And that's where, like, we as this community that has access to wealth needs to be using some of that to go into communities and literally be providing lessons and mentoring to children and bringing it all the way through until they're ready to do young artist programs. Mm -hmm. You should be looking at your community and saying like, where am I finding my artists for 15 years from now when I'm looking for new young artists? Mm. Because you could be involved in that process from the start if you really wanted to be. Right. right. And you don't have to pick up when people are, th are, are 30 and have had to make a bunch of choices about literally just surviving <laughs> or doing opera. Right. And I do think we don't talk about that like nearly enough and that we really need to be thinking like it's because it's true i mean it's like there are pipelines for white people to get things mm. you know there are it there are paths that like we have established networks because like america has like white people in america have power like i hate it's hard to talk about in a way that it's like not uncomfortable mm -hmm. but like it is the way that it works in this country and if we as white people want to see that uh, see that be different, then we have to we have to be the ones to help like create these paths and also not lead it, but listen to you know people of color about how they think it should be done in the best way, and then supporting it, you know, letting them lead and supporting. Mm -hmm. But we do need to be going and doing this very early 
because I, I was thinking about it like when I, I and this is I mean you can correct me if I'm wrong but I probably went to school with um, eight black singers at NEC total and five of them went to the same two high schools and mm -hmm. then I, as I like look at some of my other black singer friends like many of them went to these same like the same few governor schools. Really there's like a school in there's a high school in Maryland where I know like twelve black singers that are, in Virginia. Virginia. Yeah, that are extremely oh. talented. And oh. so like there are these couple of places that there is clearly like a connection, but there needs to be that needs to expand. Right. Like gr greatly expand. And it's clear that those communities are like deeply investing in in themselves. <laughs> And, you know, I don't, I think it's in spite of white people, not like with our, you know, like I think, I think it's people thriving in spite of the system. Mm. And, I, and I do think, I wish there was more just possibility <laughs> for everybody to move through a little bit easier, but we do have, we have to create new paths to do that. Right. And that starts with community engagement and it starts with radically rethinking community engagement. Oh. Right. Patrick, when you well, start your new nonprofit in a few, like when you start, I know, honey, tell them to start writing your documents out, okay? You can, so if someone's good with money that wants to work with me, um, please help because I am not great with money. <laughs> well, did you guys see Brittany's comment in the feed? In the feed, it's it's so true. And hey, girl, um, this also is so much about the ego of the artist as well. I, and it, it is, it's gonna be a huge shift that the industry is shifting. I don't think we chose to have this shift happening, but it's happening. And so now, it's it's time, yeah, needed to, I mean, yeah. yeah. So now is the time to make these changes. And I think we all got into this art form for certain reasons. And a lot of those, the reasons right now when we're recording from home, it's been stripped away. Like it's about the collaboration. It's about sharing the art. It's about helping people in their grief and joy through live art. And so like, that's what we're all like craving and missing so deeply. So I would like to think that, you know, as Brittany said, like this is an honorable thing, but how many young artists, I mean, including myself, hello. I'm like, I don't know, doing outreach. Like, oh, that's a part of that contract. I don't want to well, do and how many times have you had companies tell you you're going to be doing outreach and then be apologetic about it? Because that's something I've experienced too, where there's like, we're so sorry we have to have you do outreach, but y'all are the ones that have to do it. And I'm like, that's such a bad framework <laughs> to start yeah. from that it's like a chore to be done. Well, because it's, also, it's not. I mean, it's also like, the type of way that outreach is set up in young artist programs. I, I want to, before I talk about that, I wanted to get back to your question, Mary Hollis, about how oh, sorry, yeah. we can, it's okay, how we can like um, increase visibility of people who look like the people from the area that they're trying to go into and involve community engagement, right? Okay. So something that I think uh, must happen is to, find the root of the disease. Because I think a lot of times what we do is we treat things, um, we treat the systems, the the or the symptoms of things, right? right? We, treat, we treat the symptoms, but we need to treat the system. So when we treat symptoms, we put Band-Aids on things, we do outreach, we do community engagement, and we say, this is what we're doing. It's we're doing this because. Yeah. Right. And, and what I think will help with that is to have an actual diverse set of artists from the get-go, right? So even if you're casting for a soprano, a tenor, a bass, a baritone, five, we'll say soprano, tenor, baritone, bass. Mezzo. Mezzo. Four <laughs> mezzos. <laughs> mezzo. Well, I was, I was going to say counter tenor, like... <laughs> It's wow. like a mezzo. I live for a mezzo, honey. Don't get me wrong. I love a mezzo, especially dramatic. But um, <laughs> but I think that when you're doing the initial casting, thinking about not, okay, let me be clear, not thinking about, oh, I need to fit this box because we need to have diverse artists, mm -hmm. but thinking, oh, 
we need to reach out and say, who, who are we having audition for us? Where are we doing our auditions? Where can we expand to more HBCUs? Could we expand to places that, can we make our audition season more viable for artists who may not be able to afford to travel to New York or Chicago or, or wherever? Can we put more auditions in the South? There's no Southern really, I mean, I mean, there are, yeah. no, but no. it's a little bit, I mean, there's, it's so <laughs> scattered, right? Everything is scattered and that's money, but also having the diversity there in the, and from the get go and then taking a, a two people to go do outreach or community engagement and saying, I know that this is a little weird, right? I know that this is a little out of the norm, but just take a moment to see what we have to offer you. Just take a moment to see something a little different. And just from there, acknowledging that opera is out of the norm for a community who would not go to see an opera. I mean, I think a lot of communities, when even low income, middle class, whatever it is. Most of America. Most of America. So <laughs> acknowledging that. It's usually so poorly sung in commercials. You're like, don't think that's right. all please. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. exactly. And just, like I said before, a dialogue, letting people know, and maybe even it's, Having pamphlets with diversity on the pamphlet, even if you're, even if you're, you're the people, the young artists you have going out to sing are all white. Could, you could have a person of color in the pamphlet that you give out, child, on the website. And if you don't have accessibility to any type of materials with people of color from the past, then it's time to evaluate your own company and say, "Wow." We've been using the same black artist for for 10 years on our brochure. Huh? There's something wrong with that. Or we've been using the same Latinx singer on our website for the last 5 years. Why why is there no more diversity there? You know, why are we not why it's it's from the root, right? So I think that's the answer. It's starting out from the root of the hiring process, where you're going to get artists, where you're looking for artist talent. Um, and someone just commented uh, or showing many different voices in the same types of repertoire for learning, for questions, for experiencing in vocal timbre, for experimentation. So showing different voices, right? And then not always just having the typical kind of set there. Um, I don't know. That's my you, you touched on something that I that kind of I want to expand on just a tiny bit that I want to just like put out me and my par uh, my partner is a coach and conductor and we've been talking a little bit about this but lots of times workshops have a stage where they work in universities mm -hmm. partner with HBCUs if you partner with HBCUs bring your workshop and do it there and not just about black specific no have Ricky and, if you're doing a Ricky and Gordon please go and workshop it at the opera department at Howard. Go somewhere where there are, and get a, just get a different perspective on your work. Mm -hmm. See how your work resonates with young black people. I mean, truthfully, like that's, see what people, like go work with people and, and see how they react to the work. And then we can be better, we can be better informed about how we can go ahead and be presenting it. We can identify young artists who should be supported and, we can also bring our work to places where we kind of ignore it. And I also think, and this is my own like personal thing that I want, I think that there should be a season where opera companies only do their auditions at HBCUs and every white singer has to step foot on an HBCU campus because I will say that 99% of white people I know have never been to an HBCU, don't know anything about them. <laughs> like, and then that is its own problem. And I really like, I want, and I feel bad saying this, but I want there to white people to experience that little bit of discomfort that black people feel and Hispanic and Latinx people feel every time they come into a workspace and they're the only person that looks like them. Also, if you and don't I, know, audience <laughs> member, HBCU is historically black college or university. FYI. Go, go ahead. But no, that that's that's a kind of my like 
dream scenario yeah. that you know well, <laughs> white well, people have to experience what they don't even know that it, it, you know exists. things that they just don't know exist right well it's also tricky because right now well it's gotten better but um hbcus funding of their classical singers sometimes is not at its peak right um i mean it's a systematic thing but we also have to think like maybe the singer from the HBCU or from the small college doesn't have the same training that someone would have from a, a, a PWI, predominantly white institution, right? So it's also not just about, that's the tricky part. So it's not just about going there and being like, we wanna audition all of your students who are interested in singing in the opera, but it's also being like, what can you do as a company to foster relationships with the artists who are in your state, in your city, in your surrounding county to, to make those connections and build those connections up? It's not just about going in and being like, oh, let's see what you got. It's more about being like, oh, well, we would love to have, um, you know, we're doing this opera, we have a course space available, would you like to come in and audition for the course? Or we have a space available for whatever it is, even, you know, admin spaces, right? Like we have to talk about those things too, is making the connection, not just going and being like, well, we're here, where's the talent? Yeah. I mean, Patrick, obviously that's not what you were saying to do, but you have yeah. to be, the, the thing is, because we need a dialogue, you have to be really clear about Yes, we have of course. To be yeah. really clear about these things because a company will be like, "Oh, I just heard this great idea that we should just go to HBCU and like audition there," and no. you have to think that's probably not going to be the best step, sis. Probably you need to create and foster connection first, and then that's where you that's where you start to incorporate inclusivity, diversity, equity. You have to put in the work, and. It's hard. I think maybe companies believe that it's hard to do that, but they believe that it's hard to do that because there's no one on their staff who looks like me, right? There's no one in that administrative space that has the, the knowledge to be able to foster these connections. Or even if they don't, even if they aren't Black, have people on your team who know how to build community engagement, period, period, just overall. Right, so I don't know. I mean, that's just my my. No, thought. I think I think you're totally right, and I I mean it, that is that's the truth. Like the, the point of go the and my thought is with the workshops in going, you would be bringing music staff with you, you'd be bringing composers. You'd be there would be a part of it that is also may, potentially um, adding to the education that is already there, and that way, like you would be building you know more of a dialogue. Um, but yeah, no, I agree. And I think it is true. There is a lot, I mean, and we do a lot of slap in opera, a lot of slap dash sort of like, nah, this looks like, <laughs> like it's outreach. This looks like right. we're engaging the community. Um, and I mean, I think, again, I think a lot of it is like, comes from a place of earnestly right. trying. Really, want, really thinking that yeah. it's the right thing to do, but you know, you can think, you know, you can be walking down the street and you put your coat over a puddle for someone to step over and they step on your coat and fall into a sinkhole. I mean, you, you know what I yeah. mean? <laughs> like mm -hmm. you can think that you're doing the right thing, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you that you are. I, I want to point out a comment. Yeah, I have something to add to Gina's yeah. comments. Because um, that's a great, I think exactly. so. Exactly. I mean, exactly. Something that OTSL does so well is their AID mm -hmm. program. Yes. It's the yes. artist training program. That is young local people. They foster those talents and offer training and scholarship competitions at the end of it. Mm -hmm. And I, know, I mean, Jen Cano talks about it a lot on her Instagram. Just, you know, even having people in that level of the career talking about these things and like being so supportive. And mm -hmm. a lot of the singers I've worked with have come through that program. I was going to say that, yeah. The governor's yeah. Of the arts that we've talked about. I went to one in Kentucky that's great. Mm -hmm you know, Virginia, blah, blah, blah. Right. Exactly. It's, it's getting, start them young. That's the whole thing. It's yeah. exactly the whole thing. So yes, Gina, I think that's exactly what we're saying. And, 
on this point too, and to the COVID thing, <laughs> you know, the hovering COVID thing, mm. I do think we, sh and it, I mean, it depends on where you live, but like I live in Chicago and I think that there's so much like world-class talent in our communities that lives in these places and we don't do enough, I mean, I, I don't always find that companies do enough of connecting those people then to their engagement programs too and mm -hmm. and helping let people know that this community is already there too and that it's there if they want to be like you know it's here and there's people here and companies need to be focusing more on this local art because yeah. it's safer yeah. too yeah, like people money. it saves money <laughs> it does people and in this time that it means people don't have to travel Right. And I do think like we could be spending time helping, we could have our established local artists helping our young, our very young local artists you know, to then I, hopefully become. Yeah, we have the time right now. Right. We're at home. Well, you know something that I've heard and experienced, um, something I've heard and experienced throughout my time as a YA is that apparently there are companies who don't want to hire artists who are from the area, right? They don't want to hire local because they want their company to seem more diverse or more like international or national instead of hiring people who are talent, who have done the things, right? That are literally 20 minutes away, you know, or, or not even 20, I mean, just that are in the state who have reached out to the company and been like, look, I'm here for a month and a half. What do you have anything you'd like me to do? Like I'm, I'm here, I'm established. And then you don't hear, you either don't hear anything from the company or it's just kind of like lost in the ether. It's, it's yeah. really weird. It's really bizarre. I think this is such a weird thing because I think it's a, I think it's an optics thing to, mm. like from the companies facing their boards mm. and their and to me if you were championing local artists and building an audience around an established local local artist and people know them and and even like I, I mean I worked at a company recently where they hire one person who's frequently and they had a following at the company right. they do they and do. and and if it's a community member that yeah really brings in new money that I, and uh, uh, opens you up for, for more fundraising potentially. Cause like there is a cachet to that, you know, we're bringing in this person, they're like a local hero, but there's a lot of this like energy. And I think it has to do with um, like the fact that we're in like a Europe, a Eurocentric art form where in America to prove ourselves to this like elite class of donors we like must be more than like local American artists. We mm -hmm. must be like international to have that kind of value. And I mean, that right. has gotten better, but it goes back to the very beginning of class of opera in America. And I mean, truthfully, the only reason we started to have American artists using their like non-Europeanized names was because World War II happened and we didn't have access to bringing European singers here. So like people like Eleanor Stieber could be American artists mm -hmm. that were valued as Americans. Mm -hmm. And I do think it's a weird, I mean, like, obviously I love, part of what I love about America and its ideal state is that we are this like salad bowl melting pot. You know, I don't, it's melting pot's bad, but I, I like salad bowl a little better. You retain <laughs> your individuality, but become, come together to make something better. Um, and that is important. Like, I'm not saying we should stop championing like you know people who come here to participate in this great operatic system we we have but i do think we should value like local artists and american artists more and that if you really invest in them in a way and allow them to really know your board you, you can they're they're it's easier to get money from people because they really they are they are part of the community with the artists. I have right. so right. many thoughts about this. <laughs> talk about this for the rest of the day. But yeah, I mean, talk about community engagement. If someone, if you went to performing arts high school, if you were a part of the young or the nonprofit choirs in the area, if mm -hmm. you 
in a church, if your dad works with these people that are on the board, I'm literally speaking my own experience. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, my mom's friends who have never been to an opera in their lives would probably come see me. You yep, know, me too. who knows if that's going to like create long lasting new audience members. But again, I, and Morgan typed something very interesting. Yeah, yes. Let me pull that up. Yeah, super true. I would like companies to also consider that when they hire the local artists, they're saving a lot of money on housing, especially, mm-hmm. and, and travel. So maybe up your fee rather than decrease your fee. But again, right. we're all trying to get through COVID together. I know a lot of artists are willing to do things at a lower rate than whatever. Mm-hmm. It's a whole other conversation. But that is, thank you for that flip 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 side. Super well, well, let's talk about the that part of it, the financial, you know, realities of classical music, music education and why programs limiting our ability to express diverse artistry. That is a, a that's a chunky question, honey. Ooh. She's thick. <laughs> so <laughs> she's thick. So what can can one of you expand on what you mean by by that question. You want me to go? <laughs> well. um, I I mean, personally, this comes from like, uh, I think for me, there is an element of classical music in America, especially opera, that is very, 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 very expensive. Yes. And people are not upfront about that at the start, I don't think always. Um, and I, 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 truthfully, um, and I don't think that people are always encouraged to make the most responsible financial decisions early on in their careers, especially with school. I really, really, pers- I, I loved my experience at NEC to an extent. There were things about it that I am very, very thankful for. And there was a lot of other stuff that I feel like I paid an exorbitant amount of money for trauma. Um, yeah. Yeah. um Truthfully, I had the most one, Tanya Blythe, one of the best diction coaches in the country. Shout out to Tanya Blythe if you're there anywhere. Like I will thank her forever for what I was given in that regard. Art song exposure, great. Everything else, really crazy, really disorganized a lot of the time and really expensive. And you have to make these decisions about spending enormous amount of money that's going to potentially be with you for the rest of your life. And that allows people with a certain, of a certain class to make this choice, to make the choice to become classical musicians or opera singers with less concern than other people do. Yes. You know, <clears throat> and I think, <clears throat> and I, I was trying to think, I was trying to think about myself and like my relationship to this and my relationship as like a, you know, white man in America, but I think I'm a third generation. I'm third generation on both sides from my parents of, from immigrants, and I sometimes have this feeling that m- uh, my generation it was too soon to be trying to do opera, given how expensive it is, and given like my parents really raised me in a way where they were like, we will support you in whatever you want to do. We want you to learn and like really take whatever you're passionate about as far as you can, because like they had to make different choices and their parents had to make different choices and their grandparents had to make different choices based on just like what was literally possible based on like how close they were to being, you know, immigrants. And, you know, we've assimilated. I'm, it's easy for us to assimilate, (laughs) but still I think I probably needed to be like, two generations further along in terms of like inherited wealth Mm. to have, to not have the financial element of pursuing this career be a constant concern. And I come from an upper middle class, white suburban background, you know, Mm. and I cannot imagine, and I don't even, I, what it would be like if uh, there was any more struggle with money. (laughs) You know, I would, I, I, there were two audition seasons ago. I had an issue with a company that I was working for where they offered us contracts and then they had a budget issue. Mm. 
And when we came back for the next season, our fee was cut by almost $30,000 for the year. Oh. I had to work 40 hours a week, do a young artist program. How? Just to pay my rent. I would wake up at 4 a.m. to go downtown 45 minutes to go to a coffee shop, work for six hours, and then do lessons and coachings. And have to and then and then there be no understanding about like that causing stress on the ability to create freely right. or create with focus and i probably went like four thousand dollars into credit card debt i'll be honest mm -hmm. i had to do auditions it was my last year in this young artist program i had to get to and from new york i made some choices that i was not probably educated enough to make about money Mm -hmm. And on top of the fact that I'm, you know, whatever it is, probably close to $200,000 in debt from grad school and undergrad. That's real. Listen, yeah. That's real. I mean, like, it's a, I could have, I could have gone to private school for English, you know, <laughs> I, I could have gotten into this amount of debt for anything. So I'm not, you know, ain't, I think a lot of people are in this amount of debt. Yeah. And, you know, I don't make a lot of money. So I, you know, pay that, you know, income based for payments. But I have to make, and I know we all do, to really have a successful audition season, like let's just get to young, I'll jump to young artist programs. To have a really successful audition season, you probably need to take 25 auditions if you're like being, you know, given how competitive it is, 25 auditions somewhere in there, 20, 25, is probably a reasonable amount. If you did musical theater, you would be taking 50, 60, 70, 80 auditions a year. You would be going in all the time because it would be free to audition. But like, if you want to have really be put yourself out there, you're talking about, and you want to do 25 auditions before travel, just with applications, you're talking about $2,000. Yeah. Then that's like not factoring in what coaching's cost to prepare. It's not factoring in what the travel costs. And you're talking about potentially every single fall, spending three to four thousand dollars to do auditions for programs that pay mostly between three hundred and fifty dollars a week and six hundred dollars a week mm -hmm. there are a couple of programs that pay more than that a couple Those pro like, a, 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 like yes like 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 three or four yeah and most of them are located in cities that have an, a higher cost of living anyway mm -hmm. so when you really adjust that like what does that mean and then no one real. and then it's, it's maybe a few of those companies provide health insurance, which is like another thing. Maybe. So you're maybe, you know, I know Lyric provides health insurance mm -hmm. for the Ryan Center people, some programs never, yeah. but some are, yeah, again, some programs never do. Right. So you're like talking about putting out thousands of dollars every year for potentially between like five and 10 years mm -hmm. to be making less than a living wage. If I mean, like, thank you to my mother and father and I am very very lucky there have been times that where I have not been able to make my rent and they've helped and like that is what it is I I don't think we talk about this enough openly yeah at do. all and it's and it's and I don't and I think frequently companies don't even know I don't think that the board is thinking you know we pay the young artist this amount what does that mean based on what rent is I don't think the I don't think the I don't think it's malicious you know, I, I necessarily, no I literally have no clue. I don't know. Dialogue. And, and again, I, th and I think it's hard for people to know who make, you know, 150, 200, $300,000 a year, people who are on boards, potentially making like, you know, three, four, five, six times that $500 a week, like that number ceases to have meaning when you are making two, three, four, five thousand $5,000 a week. And I don't think that there's enough like thought about that. And so like you really have to, if you're not rich, you're committing to five to, if you want to go the young artist route, you're committing to five to 10 years of just complete financial insecurity. And we don't talk about like what that does to people's mental health, what it does to people's physical health. Yeah. Poverty is traumatic. Like houselessness, which is a big thing with a lot of singers, traumatic. Like this, these are things that have like lasting, last do lasting damage to people's psyches. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, you're asking them to produce art. Like I'll, I'll talk about it. I part of my beard started to fall out when I realized how much credit card debt I was in, and I was able to get it under under control. And it took some time, but I 
had to ask for a lot of help that I was very embarrassed about having to ask for yeah. because we are always yeah. taught to present rich. I mean, truthfully, always. Like, always. Uh, musical theater people always. can wear jeans and a t-shirt to auditions. I'm, and I'm a bigger guy. I can't buy a suit at H and M for, you know, a hundred dollars. I have to go somewhere and buy a suit that gets tailored. And you're talking like, if you want something that's not going to like have a hole in the crotch of it in three <laughs> weeks, Spending five, six, seven hundred dollars yep. just to get to get one outfit to go to auditions and gowns. Like, we don't oh feel my like god, gowns! I can't even. No. And then I've been at companies where they have told girls at the dress rehearsal for things that they need to find a new gown. Where I've been places where they, you're paying someone you know five hundred dollars a week and telling them go spend your entire pay, go find a gown that fits you. And spend your entire paycheck on it because we didn't ask you to send a picture of it first and we don't like it. And like that could put someone back on their car payments, on their rent payments, Um, on their health insurance, on their student loans. Like it is. And and then we're being expected to present the, I feel like I have been taught and it's never explicitly said, but to present as the donor class presents so that you can make them feel comfortable with you. And I that's know that's never explicitly said. That's what it is. It really is. But it, and, and even in auditions, presenting in a certain way, like it's so that a company can trust that you will be presentable in front of the people that they need you to fund, help them fundraise. And we all need them too. We can't do this art without generous, generous people yes. who love this. Yes. But it is, it's like, I am, you know, I would say, you know, lower upper middle class from Long Island, but we are not people who went to galas or, you know, like did fancy fundraising events. Um, And I really, and I have had to like, you know, develop these skills, which in some ways are great. They help you, you know, navigate all different kinds of situations. And there's, but there is, it's a class, I mean, there's an element of code switching about class that a lot of singers have to do. And I mean, I won't speak for, people of color because it's not a there you know it's not a monolithic experience but i would imagine that it's in it's intensified in for for my colleagues of color because the class thing is then also a race thing a lot of times mm-hmm. um and, and it's like reality. it's an well yeah cuz it's like presenting cuz like you then have to present like what whiteness is ideal of you know wealth is or <laughs> which is its own thing um, and there's a lot of that. And I will say there are some artists who are challenging this in the way they present and like street mm-hmm. fashion has become mm-hmm. so sort of like ubiquitous in terms of like fashion that mm-hmm. we're seeing le- more, like things are getting less stodgy, but even then you're still talking about like, if you, if you want to wear like that cute sort of like t-shirt jacket jeans, you have to have a normative body or you're going to not be seen, you know, as, <clears throat> as stylish potentially yeah. or as put together. Yeah. And the, like, and again, this is all financial decisions you're having to make and you're having to make it in a very small amount of money. And like, I, I hate feeling like it's a lot to ask of like the world to potentially be saving to like have a mortgage like as I approach 30, I feel like it's a reasonable thing to be thinking like now is the time that I should be saving. So I could maybe have a house in like six to 10 years. Love one. Yeah. But with the young artist situation, and especially given like some programs are getting rid of their age limits, like you could be stuck at this pay level for a decade. And that sets your entire life back outside of singing and I don't know if that's our, it's, I don't know if that's something you can ask an 18 year old or a 17 year old to make a decision about. We don't talk about it in undergrad. Like there's no class about what the actual industry looks like and the loneliness, the loneliness on the road, how to do your taxes as a, as a singer. I mean, I defile in seven States last year. I mean, these are the, it's kind of like when you learn algebra for four years, but you don't learn how to balance a checkbook. A checkbook. <laughs> it's like, can we just learn some like actual real life right. thing? And no, I mean, it's so easy to be starry eyed and bushy tailed and just be like, I love to sing and I'm good at it and I've been training in it and this is what I want to do. 
but there are so many real life aspects that we don't have enough conversations about and people, yeah, people aren't um, given the opportunity to really make informed decisions about what they want to do. Mm-hmm. And God, talk about privilege. I mean, there is not a chance on earth that I would still be able to do this if I had not been able to be sent to the paidest things that I did and to get on. I had, you know, my dad helped me buy performance opportunities at paidest things. And that's when I became, that's when I made the greatest strides in my, you know, in my technique and my ability to do this job was these training programs. And I believe there's a, you know, there's a reason for all of these different avenues that we have in the industry, but Mm -hmm you know, to not be paid at a summer program until I think I was 27 before I was paid to perform in a summer program. So, I mean, that's, it is, it's, it's the, the inclusion and you, know, the, you can work a retail job for your entire summer and set yourself up financially for an audition season. You can't do a young artist program. I don't know how you did that with a forty-hour job. Yeah, uh, I did it. I did it very, very poorly, and I probably won't work at that company anymore because it was. Very, I mean, that's that's the truth. Like, I felt like the financial situation made it nearly impossible for me to focus on singing the way I had to for the kind of repertoire we were doing and the amount of time you need to just focus. I mean, right. I would get up at, at three. You know, you're done with your shift at 11. Then you go down. I would walk down to school and do this. Like it was because it was like a school and um, young arts program sort of at the same time. Go do my things. Maybe go to rehearsal and be home at like five o'clock and fall asleep. You know, like and then and you can't do that when you're singing. You have to like, you know, go do your coachings, do your lessons, then go practice what you're doing. I mean, all the learning that you really do as a singer is implementing the things you learn in those like expensive hours. <laughs> you know, it's like the time you spend in a practice room on your own. And if you can't focus or you can't stay awake to do it. And I mean, and there are people who can, and that was sort of how I felt. I was like, I felt like a failure because I couldn't do it. And I was like there. And the whole time I would think there are women who have three kids and three jobs like your life and I would just stay there and be like your life's not that hard your mm-hmm. life's not that hard but that's also like not helpful and you and it makes it very hard to create but I want to bring it back to then to entering education because I kind of left this out and this is another like sticking point with privilege to get into a conservatory or get into a very competitive undergraduate program you need to have been taking lessons of some kind and like that's very expensive. Very. I mean, I, 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 my, I was very lucky. And because I was like really enthusiastic about it, my teacher gave me more time every week when I was in high school for less money, but it was still like a hundred dollars every week that I had to come with. And I worked in high school. I mean, like I, I like I, you know, I, I, it wasn't easy, but my parents helped and had, they not, you know, it, would have been a whole different story, but even then, so I'm from Long Island and I am from a place where there's some of the people are very wealthy. Many people went to Juilliard and MSM pre-college. Mm. And that is like so expensive. And I asked my parents at a one point, you know, like, can we do this? And my parents were like, if you got a scholarship and you stop taking lessons with your voice teacher here, we could maybe think about making it work. Hmm. And I decided not to because I also like didn't want to put my parents ten thousand dollars into debt before I went to school. And this is like the whole pipeline thing though, too, because this was a problem I saw at NEC. NEC's pre-college was fed like um front half of it was from Walnut Hill. So like NEC's was basically recruiting in private college, like in private high school that was boarding school. So they were like bringing in on Saturday people paying $40,000 a year for high school to have access to our facilities and things. And like, Mm -hmm. yes, those children are very talented and some of them are on scholarships, but a lot of them are just very, very rich and parents can send them to boarding school Mm -hmm. and they are having their level of access early on and just exposure to like very high quality teaching and just even performances 
is so much more than, you know, if you lived, if you were, you know, impoverished at all, or even if you lived like somewhere rural and just didn't have access and people come into these institutions where like some people are so far ahead already Mm -hmm. because they were able to pay and no fault to these parents who have the ability to, you know, you want to invest in your children. I get that. But it is really, it starts out at college being really unfair already. Like in that regard, in like what you've been able to purchase access to. And I don't feel like we like to talk about that, but I do. I think it's weird that these schools have these pre-colleges that are like wildly expensive that feed and it's good. They're, they're, you know, providing education for young people, but they use them to feed their programs to an extent. And there is like a pipeline for rich kids. Well, yeah, (laughs) I mean, that's, I think that's any, almost any conservatory. Or industry. It's not industry. I mean, it's, it's, (laughs) it's a part of the whole, it's the thing, it's the system that works, right? And if you try to disturb the system, then the funding has the potential, this is the thing, has the potential to be disrupted. Now, will it be disrupted? Who knows? Because the system's been working for so long, no one wants to touch it. So I, I think it's, it's also about creating, trying to maybe create new infrastructure that's more self-sustaining or maybe sustainable in regards to helping other people who can't afford those things. I mean, for me, I did not take voice lessons before I went to, to college, to undergrad. The thing was though, I was involved in the Richmond Boys Choir. You know, free organization. You did have to audition to get in, but it was a an organization, right? So it's also having, well, first of all, having more organizations for art in general for young people. And then also being able to have that art be accessible because I mean, there were, I'm, I'm, I did not come from a family with a lot of money or, but thankfully my grandparents were there and my, my parents, you know, did what they had to do to get me to those rehearsals and do what needed to be done. Um, but I could never have taken a voice lesson. We could not afford a voice lesson. No, ma'am. I tried, we tried to do it. It was like a hundred dollars for an hour. And that was in 2009 in like a, in a city that had multiple voice teachers. So, I mean, now, now I teach in, in my area. Thankfully, I work with a studio that has extremely reasonable prices compared to other places. Um, and thankfully, I'm able to be there and teach these students because I feel like if I would have been able to have that, you know, someone be able to come in and just, I mean, just even like four lessons before auditions. Thankf- thankfully, let me put that in a, ca- a caveat. Thankfully, I did get into these schools and I had some natural gifts. Praise the Lord. And of course, being in the boys choir, I was singing classically. I was a classically trained boys choir member, right? So that there was already that there. But if I wouldn't have had that, I definitely would not have gone into music. I would have gone into psychology. I would have gone into something totally, you know, a little different. Um, and I think that having the the accessibility to organizations that foster young talent, no matter what regard it's in, is the important part. Building up the ability to be able to have some, even if it's the smallest piece of experience, some type of experience to know how to conduct yourself for an audition or how to present yourself to, you know, people, to adults. I mean, you're 17 going into college and you're supposed to do all of these things. And it's like, how? You're just kind of riding the wave until you get there. And then you're like- But then I read something recently too that really 
disturbed me about this though is that apparently at some of these conservatories there and some of these bigger music programs there's telling people too that like we don't want to hear the 24 italian songs anymore mm -hmm. because we want young we want people coming into undergrad to show that they already have like more diverse interests in repertoire and that is like the single honestly most like classist thing i've ever heard <laughs> you know if yeah. people have access to this repertoire when they're 17 and they sing it well it should not matter if they've heard of Ricky and Gordon or Jake Heggy or whomever like that is why you, they're coming to school mm. right I mean I, I wanted to pull community engagement yeah I just wanted to pull up this from Morgan um talking about different ways of kind of community engagement. Um, I thought it was a very interesting point. Um, and just and, how to budget, you know, make decisions on what you're gonna audition for when you have to. Right. right. I, I'm gonna say this though, I find this hard as a young artist. I think it's very, very, very difficult to expect 20 somethings to know who they are so clearly that they have figured out a saleable image for themselves Marketable that then they can figure out where their artistry fits with the companies. Mm -hmm. And that is something that like, I, I, at least, and I know it's not everyone doesn't come from this perspective, but at least for me, that should be the point of young artist programs. It should be going from where you have gathered all this information in school. And then you are in these training programs where you figure out how to put it together to really figure out who you are as an artist and where you have this support system that in ostensibly should be guiding you from the professional perspective to what is going to be most successful for you to present yourself. Like that's the help I need from a company. That's the advice I wanna go to people who do casting for. Yes. I wanna know how do you see me and oh what God. part, what, yeah, and what part of what I present do you resonate with? And then what advice can you give me to make that fuller? Well, mm. the fear of, I mean, middle class artists, this has been years, but they did an article about the percentage of people that win these jobs during audition season. And as a soprano, I think it's like a 2% chance oh, that you get into one of these huge so programs. And so, the fear of not applying to everything because like maybe, you know, even if I'm the fourth option for somebody, if the other ones go to somewhere else and they need to call me, like people make these financial sacrifices because the what if is so terrifying. Mm. Um, and so I'm, and you kind of, you, how do you say it's so, I mean, I've been, absolutely blacklisted from companies because I sang too early and made a bad impression or, you know, it, and it takes years and years and years of like reworking your image until you can get back in. But I mean, I just think, yeah, it's, it's scary. And the ways, the paths to success in this career have seemed so defined by, you know, the ascent through these programs, um, that the fear of not auditioning is so real. So I love this idea. I do believe artists, like we, that's why this is the best art from the world is because like we all have something to say that's completely personal because the instrument is ourselves. So there is a place for everyone's voice. And I think what Morgan said is so important. Like, you know, companies are gonna hear you and they're gonna want your voice. Um, but being able to pick that yourself again, how like how it's so hard. And it's, it's a it's it's a level of self awareness that yeah. is very requires like a lot of maturity, yeah. mm. and like potentially sometimes I think like a lot of therapy that young <laughs> artist programs don't pay you to be able to afford. You know, to really figure out who you are and what you want to say takes and like like who you want the world to see you as. Yeah. And then figuring out how to not just know intellectually how you want the world to see you, but then how to present that. That's a lot more complex. That's like, I don't know. Is that something you even want from 20 somethings or like people in their early thirties? Like the dynamic of change to me is what's exciting about young people is that they could be anything. Yeah. Right. 
but you know, I'm also like not hiring anyone. So well, well, I think that I think that they're all great points, right? I think that everything that we've talked today talked about today are all great jumping off points. So it's about keeping this dialogue, keeping it open, expressing how we're feeling in a way that is accessible, I think, because a lot of times we tend to keep it shut, bear, you know, grin and bear it, right? And I think that we can't do that anymore. We have to let people know that there's an issue in order for them to change. We have to keep using our voices boldly in order to foster those changes. And we have to keep doing things like, you know, like this <laughs> to be able to express and tell these companies that we may not be able to necessarily have a seat at the table, but that you they're listening, they're watching, they're listening. They're, they, a lot of companies are trying to change. And I think that these kind of discussions that we're having and, and trying to foster for the future are are so important and so vital to that. Um, and I, I, I kind of cut off a little bit because we have to wrap up, but- um, I gotta go to church. <laughs> right, but I, I wanna, I just wanna thank you all for um, coming in today, expressing how you felt, the amazing conversations we had. Uh, remember that the, this can be watched again. So companies that are watching, people who are who are out there trying to find new and innovative ways of thinking, um, you know, you can always go on and listen and watch, and you can access Mary Hollis at M H Hunley on Instagram, and you can access Patrick at PDS Tenor on Instagram, and start having these dialogues with people. We need the dialogues. We need to keep talking about these things. And um, I, I just want to, we're about to close out and I know we have, there's so much more to talk about. So maybe we can come on and you, you all can do like a part two because I would love that. Have people submit questions and yeah. happy to talk about anything. I would love that. So um, maybe, you know, put some questions in the chat that you'd like to see for next time. And um, before we go, I just want to say, if you're enjoying this series, please consider making a tax deductible donation to support What's the Tea and other offerings from our Compass projects. Um, you could do it at our donor box that is linked in the comments or donate to Venmo at our Compass. Uh, the donations that are sent out today will go directly to the artists that were featured today. So please, if you can, donate, donate what you can because time is what? Money, honey. So I, I just want to thank you again for coming on today. I know we're a little rushed for time, but um, I would love to have you on again. And, and I can't wait to, to continue this conversation. Got nothing but time. Yeah, thank you so much. And both of you, just thank you for like, I know we can have this conversation because we all love this right. art form so, so much. And I just we want thank to you for having, yeah, loving open dialogue about this thing we love. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Okay. So hold on one second. Let me just thank you again for coming in. All right. Let me just, let me just uh, close out the, the stream. Thank you so much for coming today and joining us for What's the Tea with ACP. We appreciate everything uh, that you have contributed today. Please keep the discussion going in the comments and we will see you next time. We have another episode of What's the Tea coming up in the following weeks. And I hope that you come and join in. And hopefully we have a part two of our uh, series that we had today talking about young artist issues in 2020. Again, this is Elliot Page with What's the Tea for ACP, or excuse me, What's the Tea with ACP. All right. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Bye-bye.